Hebrews, if you will. Hebrews chapter number 11. Sometimes, as we have mentioned around here regularly, we allow book uh, or chapter divisions and verse divisions uh, distract us a little bit. Those are, are there for our help to be able to locate. If I wanted to take you to a passage of Scripture this morning and we had no chapters and, and uh, verse numbers, I just have to say, we'll start reading in the in the beginning until you get to uh, where it says, and what shall I say more? And then that's where we'll start. It'll take you a long time to get there. So I had to read the whole Bible almost. And so it, it's helpful for us, but it, we just need, need to make sure we keep in mind that uh, like um, the letter to the Ephesian church was not broken into chapters and so be mindful of the continuity past the chapter division. I say that because uh, as you begin chapter number 12 uh, of the book of Hebrews, we usually start there with verse 1, but uh, chapter 12 begins with the word wherefore. That tells you that it's building upon something that has been said. And so we're going to start back in verse number 32. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 32, and we're going to continue reading past the chapter division and into chapter 12 for uh, the first four verses there. So follow along as I begin reading in verse number 32, Hebrews chapter 11. And what shall I, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, uh, and of, uh, of Samson and of, of Jephthah and David also and Samuel of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of the weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned the flight, to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, uh, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report, through faith received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect, Wherefore, see, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Father, I pray that you would help us, having opened and read your word. May you now bless the reading of your word. Speak to our hearts and challenge us concerning of the great uh, legacy that we have in Christ. And that those that have followed him but gone before us have also deepened that legacy. God, I pray that we would be grateful to them, grateful mostly to you for what we have in Jesus Christ. And this Memorial Day, when we remember Lord, I pray we'll not soon forget what Jesus has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Josh, if you'd back this off just a smidgen, 
has been seemed a little uh, strong the last couple of services. Maybe my voice is just getting back to normal after a very long uh, winter with uh, having a cough and affecting my voice. Uh, Memorial Day, and welcome to our service on this Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day, like uh, special days throughout the year, are somewhat, from my perspective, they're, they're a, a kind of a unique challenge because you feel like you always have to have something different to say that, has to, that is very theme-based, you know, Mother's Day. Uh, you know, there's only so many acronyms you can find on the Internet for mother. And, uh, and bring those things out. Uh, Christmas, um, uh, even, even Easter, resurrection time, uh, you know, to talk about the resurrection. Uh, it's like, uh, kind of like when I was uh, teaching uh, the class in, at Masters Baptist College on prayer and fasting. And, uh, and I would teach uh, 18 to 20 hours, I think it was, a, uh, in a week's time, 18, 20 hours of lectures on prayer and fasting. And, you know, is, is, after a while, it's like there's only so many ways you can say pray, you know. And, and, and so this is kind of like that uh, on Memorial Day, around Memorial Day. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the things that are, that are also schedule-based uh, schedule and whatever that are not, we don't seek to be, unique or rare in its observance, like the Lord's Supper. It's not like, you know, the Lord's Supper is not the same. Every time you do it, it's the, it's the same. It's basically the same. And uh, in, in many cases, uh, many things are with funerals and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, the graveside service is basically the same every time. Uh, and so, and, and so I was, as I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, to try to be uh, on a Memorial Day, Memorial Day is focused, we were talking about on the way in a church this morning that the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day is, is that veterans, you're honoring those who are still alive uh, that have served the country. And on Memorial Day, you're, just, you're honoring those who gave their life many times uh, in service for our country. And, uh, and you know, the, the flag is flown and, and speeches are made. And, and that's all important and it's good. It's good for us, uh, uh, especially, well, just really any time. If you see someone in uniform, to thank them for the service uh, to, their, their, to our country. And that's always important and um, doesn't happen enough probably. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking about it. I said, you know, there's only so many ways we can be talking about the memorial as a Christian as we thank, we are thankful to God for our salvation. And so instead of just trying to be unique, rare, or find something that nobody else has found, uh, and I think when you do that, you push yourself into error. You know, when you start trying to find the, the, the secret, you know, coded uh, doctrine that, that has eluded generations. My pastor used to say, Pastor Gwen used to say, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's definitely not new. And he'd say, the ancients have robbed us of originality. You know, someone, someone got there before you. You think you have something unique. And, uh, and really, it's, it's just really repeating what God has said. And in this passage of Scripture, uh, I find uh, the a, a familiar message to us, and that is that many have sacrificed for our faith. Uh, just a, a note before I get into the to the body of the message, and that when it says in verse number one of chapter twelve that we are surrounded by so great or compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, the word witnesses there is from a Greek word, martus. You will recognize that Greek word as the root of our, where our word martyr comes from. And, and so when it's saying uh, that these, this cloud of witnesses that are observing and testifying, witnesses, uh, you know, witnesses can be observing something, witnesses to an event, or they can be called to testify in a trial. And witness, tell of what they saw. 
and these witnesses that surround us are the martyrs of chapter number 11. And so that's why it says, wherefore, uh, at the beginning of chapter 12, is saying that the testimony of all of these people who died for the faith in chapter 11 encourage and challenge us that we press forward in the age in which we live because we have a generation to reach for Christ. I said last week, kind of half tongue in cheek, that every generation since Jesus Christ, every, listen carefully, every generation since Jesus Christ have believed that he would come back in their lifetime. They looked for him to come in their lifetime. And we are the only generation that has not yet been proven wrong because we're still here. So it can still happen. And the truth is that we do look for the coming of Christ. But it is those who've gone before, those that Brother Wilcox reads about on Sunday morning, those that are listed here in Hebrews chapter number 11, along with so many more that are testifying to us that you can stay faithful in a sin-sick world. People say, well, it's never been worse than it is today. Yes, it has. It has, all you gotta do is go back and read that God got so sick of the sin of man that he destroyed every living person in the world except eight people, saved them on the ark. It has been worse. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we are are repeating history because the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So we are getting there but, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And so we are compassed about with this cloud of witnesses that testifies to the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. It's only right that we remember. We have a time of remembrance uh, for those who have given so much for our nation. We honor them with res- the respect that they are due. All of us, probably most of us could share stories of family members who uh, gave their life while serving our country in uh, one of the branches of our military, um, sometime probably overseas. Uh, Every citizen and every guest of this country owes uh, respect and honor to those who made that ultimate sacrifice. I, I, uh, we often talk about people that come into the country illegally and et cetera, and whether they come in illegally or, or legally, uh, they ought to be, it ought to be drilled into them. And I doubt if it is being in our woke culture uh, that this, this nation is no accident. <clears throat> the freedoms that it has enjoyed are not incidental. The, uh, the way that God has blessed it, that people from all over the world would like to come here and seek a better life. Uh, that, that is of divine origin, that God has blessed it and God has prospered it and has made it the name. And they ought to be thankful for those who have given their life for this nation, even if they are not uh, a, a citizen of this country. But there is another group is also given so much for us. And they're called Christians. The They are known by different names, but ultimately the humble name of a follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, and we can talk, uh, and I want to talk for a few moments about those who are responsible, made it possible for us to be here today with the Word of God in our hand. And the list is really uh, limitless, but let me just start with Jesus Christ that he gave the ultimate sacrifice for our lives. He died that we might live. He gave his life and that we might have life abundantly. He, uh, we, he exchanged his righteousness for our sinfulness. He put, he put uh, uh, his, his uh, righteousness upon us, took our sinfulness upon him, and without him there is no salvation. There is no plan B. There are not many doors to heaven. There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and that's only through Jesus Christ. There is no substitute. There is no addition. 
There is no and so and maybe so. There is no completer uh, that goes beyond what Jesus has done. And every other person that is responsible for passing on faith is simply a follower of Jesus Christ. We mentioned some of those, some of these that were uh, first century Christians. We have historical documents concerning their death. We know that Stephen, under the um, gaze of a young Saul who had become Paul, was stoned to death, looking up to heaven, imitating his Savior Jesus Christ, calling out for mercy on those who were doing the stoning as Jesus did for those who were doing, doing the crucifixion because they know not what they do. James, uh, the son of Zebedee, one of the sons of Zebedee was beheaded. Philip was crucified. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. That's got to be the definition of overkill. Andrew crucified on an X-shaped cross. Mark was dragged to pieces. Peter crucified upside down, not feeling worthy to die in the same manner in which his Savior died. Paul was beheaded. Jude crucified. Bartholomew crucified as followers of Christ. Thomas run through with a spear. Luke was hanged. Simon uh, Zelotes was crucified. John died of old age as an exile. God used him to write, write a large portion of the New Testament, the, 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 the longest treatise on love in the New Testament was penned by John. Then there's beyond the first century Christians, there's those who were uh, founding fathers of the New Testament church, those that followed in the, in the Anabaptist um, uh, vein of things, Anabaptists meaning uh, against baptism, and, and what the, the name that was given to our forefathers of Anabaptists is not because we were against baptism, we were for scriptural baptism. And so when somebody would come out of the state church, they would get scripturally baptized, they would believe on Jesus Christ and become, and become a Christian, and then get scripturally baptized and the state church saw that as a, a refutation of their authority because you were getting rebaptized. And baptism, baptism doesn't get enough um, importance that it should scripturally. Because baptism identified you with truth and specifically the truth as it resides in Jesus Christ. And when you, were, when you were baptized by the state church, they believe that that's washing away your sin or at least part of your sins. Then you're finding your salvation in the church. And when you got baptized again, you were saying this was null and void, that this was insufficient, that there's no saving power in this. They took that rather personally. In, in the, by far and away, in the court records that we have of people that were tried for as heretics, the thing that got brought up more than anything else, more than any other belief system or any, any other statement of faith was baptism. Why? Because baptism was a definite public act. Of, it was a statement that I have trusted Jesus Christ. I believe the doctrine that is being taught and preached by, by the true child of God, the true Christian church, and not the state church that says, you know, work your way into heaven or buy your way into heaven as it, as it pertains to indulgences and things like that. And, uh, and so uh, that baptism identified you with that. That's why John would not baptize the Pharisees until they went and did something that looked like they were repentant because they, they wanted to identify with John's message without actually living a repentant life. He refused to allow them to. There were men like Ellert Jansen. Ellert Jansen was an Anabaptist martyr. 
He suffered uh, the persecutions of the Anabaptists near the middle of the 16th century in the Low Countries and then under the government of Charles V. In, in 1549, he was put in prison in Amsterdam with 19 other Anabaptists. While his uh, other friends escaped from prison, he remained behind. He could have escaped, and he said, I will not. The doors were open, and he would not leave. He was determined to profess openly uh, his, his uh, faith in Jesus Christ or die in defense of that faith. March the 20th, 1549, he finally suffered uh, that coveted martyrdom, martyrdom being burned at the stake. George Wagner was one of the first Anabaptist martyrs to die at the hands of the Germans. Like others before him and after him, he was bound and then thrust into the fire. He was apprehended in Munich and Bavaria on account of four articles of the faith. These are the four charges that he answered uh, for with his blood. First charge, that the priest cannot forgive sins. And we say to that, amen. Secondly, he did not believe that a man can bring God down from heaven. What that's referring to is turning the elements of the mass into the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. He said, I don't believe that. And we say, amen. Thirdly, he did not believe that God or Christ is bodily in the bread which the priest has upon the altar but that it is simply as symbolically the bread of the Lord, and we say amen. And fourthly, he did not believe that water baptism possessed any saving power, and we say amen. The things that he died for, testified, he was charged with, are things that we fundamentally believe. Menno Simmons was a former Catholic priest and one of the prominent leaders of the Anabaptists in the Netherlands. The Netherlands today is a very difficult place to start a church. We have missionaries that are there, uh, trying to, and they've started a church there, and they're doing well, but it is a difficult place. And in northern Germany, he was also there during uh, one of the movement's most difficult uh, periods. Roger Williams... Roger Williams was uh, moving from, from, the, from uh, Europe to here. Um, Roger Williams was a staunch advocate of separation of church and state. Separation of church and state gets, um, gets um, uh, taken over by people who are trying to keep religion out of our nation. But separation of church and state simply originally meant that the, church, that the state could not tell the church what to do. That's all it meant. And separation of church and state is we should not have a state-sponsored religion where the, the church is beholden to the state for money in order to, because then, then it's going to become subservient. Now they, they want it to mean that there's no religion in the public uh, sector of our nation. That's not what it originally meant. Roger Williams was an advocate of that. He, con he was convinced that there was no scriptural basis for a state-sponsored church. He was expelled by Puritans from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and uh, for spreading new and dangerous ideas. Why? Because the Puritans were the official religion of that colony. They were getting tax money in order to fund themselves. Baptists were offered that and refused it on principle. They, listen, that's what they came out of when they came to this continent. And the only difference is, who is the state church? And they said, no, on principle, we won't accept it. And so it, it became the Puritans. So he was expelled, and then he established the Providence Plantation in 16. 36, as a place of refuge, which he called liberty of conscience. That's what he called it. In 1638, he founded the first Baptist church in America, literally the first Baptist church in America, not just by name, also known as the first Baptist church of Providence. Uh, then Peter Cartwright, 
was also known as the Lord's Plowman. He was an American circuit riding evangelist in the Midwest, as well as twice elected a legislator in Illinois. Peter Cartwright helped start America's Second Great Awakening, personally baptizing 12,000 converts, riding county to county on horseback, baptize over 12,000 people. He rode circuits in Kentucky and Illinois, as well as Tennessee, Indiana, and Ohio. Obadiah Holmes. Obadiah Holmes was an early Rhode Island settler and, uh, and Baptist preacher who was publicly whipped in the Massachusetts Bay Colony for his beliefs and his activism. He became the pastor of the Baptist Church in Newport, Rhode Island, a position which he, he continued there for 30 years. There are other names like David Brainerd that you know well, Hezekiah Smith, John Clark. John Clark was a doctor and Baptist preacher. He arrived in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1637. He became co-founder of Portsmouth and Newport, Rhode Island, and established America's Second Baptist Church. This is what Second Baptist really meant, the actual Second Baptist. Second Baptist Church. Uh, and Baptists were considered heretics and banned from Massachusetts. Clark wanted to make inroads there and spent time in the Boston jail after making a mission trip to the town of Lynn, Massachusetts. You see, Bible believers were not just imprisoned overseas, they were imprisoned in the colonies here. You've heard the name Adoniram Judson. He was a, an American Congregationalist and later be a particular Baptist. He, he changed to become a particular Baptist who served in Burma for almost 40 years. At the age of 25, he was sent from North America to preach in Burma. Judson translated the Bible into Burmese, as well as established a number of Baptist churches in Burma. He is remembered as the first significant missionary in Burma, as well as one of the first missionaries from America to travel overseas. Over and over again, you have these people that have followed Jesus Christ followed the apostles, and have left their stamp on history, passing down uh, to, from one generation to another. And this is what I want you to recognize, is that in every generation, there are those who have stood up for the faith and passed it on to the next generation. There are founding church groups, sometimes known as Anabaptists, that we talked about, sometimes by the name Waldensians, uh, based on one of the, the prominent leaders, his name was Waldo. And so they became known as the Waldensians, Donatists. Some of these names had to do with places. Some of them had to do with people. But it simply depicted people that believed basically like we believe from the Bible. And they were outcasts. They were hunted. Uh, they, were, uh, they were imprisoned. And they were put to death. We talked about uh, in Hebrews chapter number 11, how many of those died. We talked about the apostles and how many of those, uh, according to history, uh, sealed their testimony with their blood. And on top of that, we have the record of history of all of the terrible things that happened to, to Christians down through history, from being burned to being beheaded. Some of you and I, along with me, have have stood at places where public beheadings took place in different places like, like uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, um, Germany. Um, in the mornings when we were in Germany, uh, the, the group was staying in, in one town. And I was at a bed and breakfast uh, out at a little, a little place up in the Swabian Alps. And in the mornings when we didn't have anything going on, I remember I would, it was just a short drive outside the little, little town, little village there. And there, then a short walk up a trail to what remained of an old castle. And there was, all it was, it sounds more grand than it was, than it, than it is today. It was basically the foundation stones, uh, a part of the castle that, that was below the earth, 
It was subterranean, had, you know, uh, dirt behind a wall. That wall was still standing and things like that. But, but most of the things above ground were just stubble. Uh, the remains of, part of the remains of a little tower there. We've got some pictures of, of some of you uh, uh, in that uh, there. And, and there was a plaque on what, that lower wall, which would have been a lower, like a dungeon type area. And the plaque is, is there dedicated to uh, some, a couple of men, but it said in this place, uh, I didn't bring it in with me this morning, I've got the translation of it, it's all in German. I had Brother Richards translate it for me. But it said in this place were many, were many Baptists imprisoned. And it told about some of their beliefs, the things that they held to that got them imprisoned. I asked... Um, I asked, you know, how were they typically put to death? And they said most of the time they were just left in the dungeon to starve. Once they starved to death, they would just throw their lifeless corp down, corpse down the mountainside for the animals to eat. In the mornings when we didn't have anything planned, I would, after talking to the innkeeper, trying to witness to him as best I could, um, his, his English was poor, but it was better than my German. But I would go out to that place and spend time in, with God's word and prayer. And it's, there's, something, there's something powerful about being in the place. We're not worshiping these people, but about being in the place where some of these people gave their life for, their, for the testimony of Jesus Christ could have escaped and didn't because they wanted the opportunity to speak publicly before a crowd as they were being put to death. Some were beheaded, shot with arrows, hung, stoned to death, boiled in oil, pulled apart on a rack, pulled apart between horses, hung on a pole with hooks, crucified, red hot irons rubbed all over their body, beaten to death, fed to wild animals, ground to death in a millstones, uh, thrown into the sea with weights tied about their neck, uh, maimed. I, some of these are just, they're, they're hard to even read. And so I'm just going to pass over them and just the worst things you can imagine. And to all these people, we say, we owe a debt for the fact that they stood in their generation they stood as light in darkness in their generation. We, in today's, in our culture, have not yet resisted unto blood. We've given very little. But let me say, it is time for us to do our part. You say, you mean to be martyred? No, I, I don't know that that's going to happen. I'm not saying it couldn't, but, but in our culture, it's not likely that we'll suffer martyrdom we think it's martyrdom when somebody slams the door in our face or doesn't want to hear the gospel. We think, we think that that's, you know, we really suffered for Jesus. And the truth is we've suffered very, very little. But I made the point that every generation has had people that believe the book, stood firm on the faith, and they've, been, they've taken responsibility for their generation. But they are not here. You and I are here. It is our responsibility. There's no time for us to sit back and say, well, let's just coast into heaven. There's no time for us to sit back and say, well, I'm just, uh, you know, I just don't want to teach a class anymore. I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, um, come to prayer meeting. I don't want to go out and knock doors. I don't want to, I don't want to do these things anymore because, you know, I'm just tired and I've done my part. No, no, no. We're still responsible for our generation. It is our responsibility to tell people about Jesus Christ. You, you can think all you want that somebody else will do it. But how many times it is that we come across people who have never truly heard the gospel, never heard uh, what it means to have their sins forgiven. John chapter number four. Look there with me real quick. John chapter four. Yes, I know. John chapter number four, 
Baby's just expressing what everybody else is thinking. Time for lunch. John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Notice that's a question mark. Isn't this what you say? He says, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, and both that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Hey, notice this. We are sent to reap in a field that others have labored in. Yeah, this is our generation. And what does he say to, what did Jesus say to his generation? He said, say you not, there are yet four months, and then come the Even then, people said, well, you know, it's not the time for harvest. He said, isn't this what you say? And I look around, and I say, yeah, there's a lot of Christians today saying that. Saying this is not the time for harvest. This is not the time of revival. This is not the time for world evangelism. This is not the time for door knocking. This is not the time for distributing gospel literature. This is not the time. And Jesus said, lift up your eyes. And if you lift up your eyes, you see people all around us that need Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 11, Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. He that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We're not inventing a new gospel. We are responsible to build on the foundation that's been left to us. Paul, as a wise master builder, made sure that he preached Jesus Christ. So I'd, I'd say this, every generation benefits, reaps the benefits of previous generations. We have what is left to us from those who've gone before us. And then number two, every generation has the same mission, which is the Great Commission to reach people for Christ. How long has it been since you shared Jesus with somebody else? I've been grateful for the opportunities over the last year or so, two years or so, that God has given me to find people to witness to um, and to see a few people come to Christ. And I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Uh, our, number three, our generation has yet to shed much blood. Even, or even sacrifice much for the gospel. And I'm talking about our culture. There are places around the world where people do suffer. But we see everything through our lens. And we have not suffered much. Well, I can't say any, I can't talk to somebody, so-and-so because they'll laugh at me. They'll make fun of me. Oh, poor us. Somebody might mock us. Somebody might make fun of us. Somebody might not be receptive to the gospel. But then number four, what will be said of our generation. What have we contributed to the spread of the gospel? What will, if Jesus does not come, what will the next generation testify of us? What spiritual legacy will we leave them? Will we leave them a nation that is, has gone the, the way of wokeness and churches have, have uh, become subservient to the culture and there's no shining light out there anymore to break into the darkness? Is that what we're going to leave to the next generation? You say, well, Jesus is coming. I hope so. I pray he does. It'd be great if he would come right now. I keep trying that and it just doesn't work. It'd be great. 
But what kind of, listen, and we can make this, well, yeah, but preacher, the nation, the et cetera. All right. What kind of witness do we leave here? Uh, if Jesus doesn't come, you and I are not getting out of this alive. What kind of church will we leave for the next generation if it comes to that? If Jesus does not come, what will be the testimony? What will, be the, what will they say about this generation of the church, of this church? The, when the National Cemetery was um, consecrated on uh, November 19th, and in 1863, Abraham Lincoln gave probably his, one of his best known speeches there. We call it the Gettysburg Address. Children memorize it, used to memorize it in school. Now, uh, Abraham Lincoln's probably not even allowed in the textbook. But what most people don't remember and that I've mentioned to you before, and again, I give, I've given up on trying to find unique information for things like this, but it's good for us to be reminded. Just before Abraham Lincoln got up and spoke his, uh, for just what took just a few moments, he, he spoke 10 sentences, Abraham Lincoln did. But before he got up to speak, there was a man named Ed, Edward Everett that stood and spoke for over two hours. And nobody even knows his name. Nobody quotes him. No one references his speech. And he sat down and Abraham Lincoln stood up and he said these words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground because the brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the full last measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, end quote. And I'd say to you, those are, those are memorable noteworthy words that as a nation it's not just to to memorialize those who gave their life but the real way to memorialize that is to carry on and build what they died for it is for the living to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they who fought here have so far thus nobly advanced and I'm not talking about America right now. I'm talking about Christians. It is for us to advance the, the, the truth that those who gave their life for the cause of Christ did advance. When President Lincoln spoke 
these words at Gettysburg, it was not entirely clear that the nation would survive because they were in the middle of the, they, 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 they still, uh, uh, the uh, aftermath and the, and the end of the Civil War. It was not clear that they would survive as a nation. And so he called upon them to advance the purpose for which they had died. Luke 18, 8 says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Listen, what will be the testimony of our generation? And I want to challenge you today, on Memorial Day weekend, let's remember those who helped us get where we are today, spiritually. Uh, let's remember those who gave their life. Let's remember it is our time now, it is our generation, to win the lost to Christ. And our generation is not here forever. And just like every generation since Christ until now, they believed that they were the generation that would see the coming of the Lord in the clouds. And we believe that. But think about our response to that. As I preached recently that, that men respond differently to fear. Some that thought about the, the master's return put the resources to good use, realizing he's going to expect his own with usury but the man who received one talent responded with his fear to hiding it, even though he knew that the master would come and look for it. And if we believe that Jesus Christ could and will come in this generation, isn't that motivation to get more busy, not less? Isn't that generation to press forward, not take it easy? And I, think, I fear that a lot of times Christians say, well, Jesus is going to come, so let's just sit here and twiddle our thumbs and, and look up. He's coming, look up. And the truth is, we ought to respond thinking about the judgment seat of Christ. We ought to respond with action. We ought to respond with, <coughs> with service. We ought to respond with uh, dying to self and saying no to the flesh and trying to do what we can to reach others for Christ. Memorial Day is a day to remember the men and women of our country who gave their lives while serving uh, this country. It's also a day for us to remember how we got to where we are. Someone, someone preached the message of the gospel. Someone preached the message. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to grow up in a Christian home where I heard the gospel before I could understand the gospel. Eventually trusting Christ when I was 21. But I'm grateful for that foundation that they laid in me so that, listen, when the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, I didn't have to go learn anything. I knew it. It was there. What will we do with our generation? Father, I pray that you would help us as we are mindful of these who've given their life physically for our nation, we're grateful for the liberty that we have, grateful for the freedom that we have. And God, I pray that you would help us to use that for your honor and glory, but we're also mindful that what, is, what freedom we have was not free. The same thing is true spiritually, Lord, the salvation that we have is free to us, the free gift of eternal life. But it was not free. It cost, it cost you everything. And then others have paid a price to hand it down to us. And Lord, I pray that we would take responsibility for our generation. That we today, Lord, this familiar message every Memorial Day, it comes back to this. That we are reminded that this is our time our responsibility, not somebody else's, not the previous, not the next. We live in this generation. God, I pray that that would drive us to excel in our Christian life, to spend more time in prayer, more time in the Word of God that we might be uh, unashamed before you, rightly dividing the Word of truth to know what the Bible teaches and says. Living a holy, separated, godly life 
raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to know the truth of God's word. And God, that we ought to take that seriously. We are responsible for this generation. Lord, I pray that there'll be uh, the, that the majority of the people here would understand that and take it seriously that for their responsibility. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. With our heads bowed,